Our guest is Lester Brown, founder and president of Earth Policy Institute. He's the author of countless books, including Full Planet, Empty Plates, The New Geopolitics of Food Scarcity, and World on Edge, How to Prevent Environmental and Economic Collapse. Uh, Lester Brown, good to have you with us. Thank you so much for coming. I'm going to uh, ask you the opening question from the preface of your book, World on the Edge. How are you? I'm fine. It's the world I'm worried about. The world you're worried about. What are you worried about? Climate change, population growth, soil erosion, dust bowls forming in, in both Asia and China, water shortages. Half of us now live in countries where water tables are falling because we're over pumping. You can over pump in the short run, but not in the long run. Um, the World Bank estimates, for example, that 175 million people in India today are being fed with grain produced by over pumping. My estimate for China is that 100 and, 120 million Chinese are being fed with grain produced by over pumping. So we've, we've got a lot of problems on the food front, including climate change, uh, including water shortages, including relentless population growth. I mean, there will be 219,000 people at the dinner table tonight who were not there last night. Mm. And tomorrow night, there'll be another 219,000 waiting to be fed. So it's food shortage and population growth. Huh? Right, and climate change exacerbating the, the food situation, making it more difficult for farmers to expand production rapidly. I was surprised to uh, read in your new book, Full Planet, Empty Plates, that uh, corn is the number one uh, uh, grain. That, grain that we produce in the United States. In the world. In the world. Four-fifths of our harvest grain? In the corn? U.S. In the, in, in the U.S., yeah. Corn is big here. Um, when you, uh, we have quite a bit of land in wheat, but the yields are very low compared with corn. Mm -hmm. the, the U.S. Midwest is an extraordinary piece of agricultural real estate. Mm -hmm. Just to illustrate that, Iowa produces more grain than Canada. Hmm. And Iowa is simultaneously challenging China in soybean production. We have some really good farmland in, in the U.S. Midwest. Mm. Do we sell a lot of it abroad? The grain, we do sell a lot abroad. Um, a large share of our corn crop goes abroad as exports. An even larger share uh, goes into ethanol distilleries to produce fuel for cars. Mm. Uh, the other big use, of course, is feed, which is what corn was originally grown for. In this country, the amount of corn used for fuel for cars has just passed in the last year or two the amount that we feed to cattle. So we now use more corn to fuel cars than we do to feed livestock and poultry. And all over the world, uh, uh, societies are more affluent, so they eat differently, don't they? They, 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 they want uh, foods where this business of where does the effort go and it's going into the cars, as you say. It's going into the society that wants more beef. Yeah, there are probably three billion people in the world today moving up the food chain, consuming more grain-intensive livestock products mm -hmm. and poultry products, more meat, milk, and eggs. Um, just to put that in focus, in India, the average consumption of grain per person per year is about 400 pounds, which is a pound a day. Mm -hmm. In the U.S., it's 1,600 pounds. Of that, we consume maybe 200 pounds directly as bread and pastries and breakfast cereals. The other 1,400 pounds we consume indirectly in the form of beef, pork, poultry, mm. milk, eggs. Seven billion people in the world. You say in uh, Full Planet Empty Plates, you say uh, a billion people are either chronically uh, hungry or malnourished. And then a statistic, 48% of the youngsters in India have some kind of a physical or mental stunting, stunting of their growth. That's, if we say no more in the program, 
that's a horrible statistic to even contemplate. It is. Half the kids. Half the kids. My Lord. Yeah, it's, it's a serious problem because uh, those youngsters will not be able to develop their, their full genetic potential. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, either physically or, into, but more importantly, intellectually. We didn't hear much in the campaign uh, about climate change. When we talk about climate change, we're talking about the earth getting warmer, is that it? Yes. Okay. And the culprit there is carbon, huh? Yes. C CO2, right? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Burning oil and coal. Mm -hmm. So fossil fuels and the earth gets warmer. Greenland, these ice sheets, tie the two of those together for me, will you please? Well, the, the ice in the world is starting to, to melt almost everywhere, whether it's the glaciers in the Himalayas and the Tibetan Plateau or Greenland or um, uh, Antarctica, or the, the Arctic sea ice is shrinking dramatically. Mm -hmm. The melting of that ice will not affect sea level because that ice is already in the water. There's no land in the Arctic. It's all the Arctic Sea. Um, but the ice melting on Greenland will raise sea level. If the Greenland ice sheet, which is a mile thick in places, were to melt entirely, sea level would rise 23 feet. Hmm. It would be a very different map of the world than the one that you and I have grown up But with. is that possible? It's not only possible, it's likely if we continue burning fossil fuels um, and raising atmospheric CO2 levels. CO2 serves as a blanket. Light comes through CO2, no problem, but when the heat is generated on the Earth's surface and starts to radiate back out, the CO2 traps some of it. So the Earth slowly warms, and that's what we're experiencing now. What do you think of those people? I shouldn't say those people, because some of them are respected, I gather, uh, who don't believe in this global warming or climate change. What, what, do you, what, do you, what, 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 what goes through your mind? I don't think you can find an article in a scientifically refereed journal mm. that will question the reality of climate change. It's basic physics. I mean, CO2 is a measurable gas. We mm -hmm. can measure it to parts per million in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. it, it is a greenhouse gas in the sense that light goes through it, but heat is impeded somewhat by it. Mm -hmm. So the more CO2 you have, the more heat you trap, and the warmer the Earth gets. It's basic physics. Let me take a little break. Uh, we're talking with Lester Brown. He's president of the Earth Policy Institute. Uh, he's won all kinds of awards, uh, MacArthur Fellowship, uh, honorary degrees, written 50 books, articles. We're talking about a couple of them so important. Uh, World on the Edge, How to Prevent Environmental and Economic Collapse. That's uh, one that I've read cover to cover, and uh, a brand new book that I'll just add to the deck here, Full Planet, Empty Plates, The New Geopolitics of Food Scarcity. Let's uh, sit tight. This is a very important program we're doing here. Uh, this is America and the World. This is America is made possible by the National Education Association, the nation's largest advocate for children and public education. Poonsan Corporation, forging a higher global standard. The CTC Foundation, AFO Communications, and the Rotondaro Family Trust. Uh, Lester, uh, if I may call you uh, Lester. Um, so we're talking about food shortage, population growth, water scarcity, which affects food production, food shortage, poverty, and the warming of the earth. Some of your fellow uh, researchers, scientists, and such say by 2020, 
or 2030 in there someplace, we could be heading for the perfect storm. That was the phrase they used. I want to talk about water because I want to understand this business of water. Correct me where I go wrong. It either comes from the sky or you can get it from the earth by drilling down. I had to go not only to your book, but to the dictionary, to the internet. Aquifiers. Tell me about aquifiers. It's actually produced, pronounced aquifers. Aquifers. Yeah. There we are. Um, aquifers. Yeah. I've never even run into the word before. Really? No. What is it? Aquifers. Aquifers are water stored underground. There are certain soil strata beneath the surface, often uh, gravel and sand, where water is stored because there's a lot of room between the large particles. Um, and these we call aquifers. They are, in a sense, underground rivers because when, when it rains in North America, for example, or snow melts in the mountains, it, it, it returns to the sea eventually. Now, some of it is on the surface in the Missouri River or the Mississippi River or um, uh, whatever, or the Colorado River, but some of it goes underground, seeks down and then and moves through these aquifers eventually to the, the rivers and, and to the ocean. So we see part of the water flow, but we don't see the other part. And it's that, now there are some aquifers, aquifiers to use your term, um, <laughs> there are some aquifers that are fossil aquifers. That is, this is water that was put down eons ago yeah, in yeah, geological yeah, yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For example, under the U.S. Great Plains, we have an aquifer that goes from Texas down, sorry, from Nebraska down to the Texas Panhandle. It's called the Ogallala Aquifer. That is essentially a, a fossil aquifer. <clears throat> and if you fly from New York to Denver or fly across the country, you'll see these crop circles. In the center of each of these circles in the, in the Western Plains um, is a pump that's pumping water from underground. Now, in the Western Plains, most of those are pumping from the Ogallala. But in some places, that aquifer where it's thinnest has already been depleted, such as in uh, southern Kansas, for example. So farmers there have gone back to dry land agriculture, gone from irrigated corn at 150 bushels an acre back to dry land wheat at 40 bushels so, an acre. So the, the aquifers, uh, you're drilling down to get water for irrigation mm -hmm. purposes. Mm -hmm. Now, when you look at a China, when you look at an India, when you look at a, a San Diego came into the picture there someplace, the drilling is so extensive that it's, uh, what am I looking for here? It, it's it's, it's, it's just, depleting. It's depleting. The aquifers. So, so we have a water shortage, huh? Water shortage is going to affect the food yes. supply. The... Um, um, Probably 40% of the world's grain comes from irrigated land. Now, a big chunk of that is rice, all of which is irrigated almost by definition. But a lot of wheat um, is also irrigated in countries like India and China, uh, not so much in the U.S. Um, um, corn is irrigated, too, in, in a country like China. And you say that 70% of the water is for irrigation, 20% for industrial, 10% for residential. I was surprised at those figures. Yeah, at let, the, let me just mention one thing. Mm -hmm. um, we think of water and we think of, you know, household use and drinking yeah, water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the big use of water is to produce food. Because yes, for yes. one ton of grain requires a thousand tons of water. So the amount that we drink is trivial. The big use of water is to produce our uh, food. And, 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 and the drilling is too much. Too much. And, uh, and that's going to affect the food. And at the same time, the land is, uh, you mentioned the dust uh, thing, the, the right. de is becoming more desert-like, is that right? Like it the is. dust. What happened in the 1930s in the United States so we can relate? Right. We had, we had a dust bowl in the 1930s, which was also the, the Depression decade. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. we had both of them coming together. And in the Southern Plains, um, we had um, land that we had uh, plowed that had originally been grassland, a lot of land we plowed that shouldn't have been plowed, uh -huh. and we were farming it. And then it got dry and it started uh, blowing. Um, 
what was the Faulkner um, novel? Um, well, you're thinking of Steinbeck? Uh, 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 Steinbeck. Sorry, Steinbeck. Yeah. Um, uh, the Jode family was moving west uh, because of, uh, headed for California because they'd been displaced. Grapes uh, of Wrath. Grapes of Wrath. Thank you. Um, the, um, the Dust Bowl here was something we were to get, uh, able to get under control. The first thing we did was to put some of that land back in grass, and then we began uh, strip cropping, where you where you plow land the strips in alternative years, so they're in grass yeah, and yeah, yeah. so forth, so mm -hmm. that helps yep. stabilize things. We planted tree shelter belts in the Great Plains, particularly in the Northern Plains, to, to slow down the wind so it wouldn't blow the soil. So we did a number of things. But we were able to get that situation under control. For one thing, we had a lot of slack in the system. We were producing far more than we consumed, so we, ex we were the world's leading exporter. We were the breadbasket for the world then, as, as we are now. But in places where it's happening now, like the northern part of China, for example, or the Sahelian region of Africa, there's enormous pressure on the land, and we're seeing dust, dust bowls form that will dwarf uh, are dwarfing the one that we had in the United States. Hey, you know what? I shouldn't say hey. That's that's. But <laughs> uh, 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 but I was surprised to read that some countries are either buying land in other countries mm. or leasing land in other countries because they don't have enough food production in their own. Right. countries? What, what, what sort of triggered all this was in 2007, 2008, we had a, a globally a, a, a poor harvest. Grain prices doubled. And even at that high price level, um, exporting countries like Russia and Argentina, both leading wheat exporters, restricted yeah, yeah, yeah. or banned their mm -hmm. exports. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, importing countries began to feel very vulnerable. Sure. And so they began looking around, and they realized that the only thing they could do would be to try to buy land in other countries That's on which amazing. to produce food it's for amazing. themselves. It's amazing. It is. Amazing. It's, it's a monumental loss of faith in the market, because throughout history, up until then, if you wanted to buy grain, you could always buy it. I mean, the price would go up once And these more. are some high roller countries that no are question. doing that. That's right. So we've got water, we've got the land, the population, they think by... 20, what, will be 50. 8 billion, 2050 will, will be, be 8. 9 billion by 2050. 9 billion people, right. mm -hmm. 9 billion people. We got the demand for food. We got affluence, which is driving people to eat foods that require more grain, more drilling, no water, cars using ethanol now, using up some of the grain. Then on top of all of that, you have two other things that you talk about, environmental refugees, and fail states, please. Well, one of the things that's happened, um, and Yemen would be a classic case of this, is a country is beginning to lose the capacity to feed itself. Everywhere in Yemen, water tables are falling. In the capital, Sana'a, um, if you have a well that reaches the water table, you can only you can only turn the water on every four days or yes, something like that. Yes. We're simply outrunning the sustainable yield of aquifers, the sustainable supply of water. And it is beginning to show up in world food prices. And anyone who thinks this current surge in prices is temporary and things are soon going to go back to normal, have got some, some more thinking to do. Because um, for two reasons. One, water shortages are here to stay and water supplies are going to get tighter. They'll be much tighter five years from now than they are today. Mm. Um, uh, and then the, the, the other thing of course, is, is climate change. It used to be, I grew tomatoes from 1951 to 1958, and once in a while you'd have a, a dry year or a bad year, but you knew the next year things would go back to normal. Well, farmers today um, experience dry years or drought years, but there's no norm to go back to because the Earth's climate's in a constant state of flux now. Agriculture as it exists today evolved over an 11,000 year period designed to maximize production with that climate system. But that climate system is no more. So yeah, now yeah, yeah. each year the agricultural system and the climate system are more and more out of sync with each other. Lester, what's plan B? Uh, lay that on the table. Very quickly. 
we've got to get the brakes on population growth. And the key to that is making sure that women who want to plan their families everywhere have access to family planning services. It costs about this much. So little get lost in the rounding of our defense budget. But it may be more important than our defense budget in terms of long-term security. Um, second thing we need to do, we need to raise water productivity. A half century ago, we realized there was not much new land around and we started raising grain yields. The average grain yield last year was triple what it was in 1950. Dramatic rise in land productivity. We now have to raise water productivity. The other thing we need to do is we've got to stabilize climate and do it quickly. And this is almost a, a World War II type mobilization, like 1942 when we totally restructured U.S. industrial economy. Roosevelt banned the production of cars and they went to producing tanks and, and planes on assembly lines. And, and we turned out thousands and thousands of, of tanks and planes. So it's that kind of restructuring we need moving from fossil fuels to renewable sources of energy, wind and solar and geothermal, and there's an ex enormous amount of each of those. Any one of those three can provide enough energy to easily run the world economy. You say that uh, as far as the carbon and the CO2, you, you feel so very strongly about that. Uh, that if there are going to be these emissions, they should be taxed to the hilt, huh? Well, what we have, what we should have is a full cost economy. Uh, when you buy a gallon of gasoline today, you pay the cost of pumping the oil, refining it into gasoline, getting the gasoline to the local service station. So you say a $3.50 a gallon of gasoline really costs what? Twice that, three times that, when you include the cost of climate change. I mean, how do you put a price tag on climate that's changing so fast? So you're saying fast? tell the truth. Tell the truth. Get it out there. We need an honest market. We don't have it now because the market does not incorporate the cost of things like climate change. I like those places. So you said taxing the CO2, embracing the new technologies, wind, solar, geothermal is a big one. And some countries that you wouldn't expect are into that, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. Well, Japan, since... Uh, Fukushima is yeah. moving to geothermal big time, but this is a country that has 10,000 hot baths, natural hot baths. They have a lot of geothermal energy very close to oh, the surface. Yes. I was talking with the president of Iceland in a, at a conference yeah. a week ago. Iceland is, wants to drop a cable, on, just lay an undersea cable to the UK so they can use their geothermal energy oh. to generate electricity and sell it to Europe. So cooperation is very important. It is. I like your idea that you put forth uh, that some of the uh, areas are taxing uh, people who don't recycle. Uh, so you're talking about uh, 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 either rewarding or taxing people who are not taking care of the environment. I think that's a good idea as well. The first city in the United States to recycle everything, nothing goes to the, to the garbage heap, mm -hmm. is San Francisco. So they demonstrated it can be done. But in many cities, we only recycle 30 or 40 percent of things. Mm -hmm. The rest goes to uh, uh, garbage heaps and, and so forth. It's, in, it's a huge waste of resources. You've got a $200 billion investment on the table as well, which would cover some of these uh, mm -hmm. things. Uh, that would take a cooperative effort from a lot of countries, wouldn't it? It would. And, and that $200 billion, uh, uh, investment includes everything from uh, population growth to uh, energy efficiency incentives, um, but also um, would be offset by, by taxes on, on carbon, for example. We're uh, at just about at the end of our time. What you've put on the table is either business as usual or war mobilization. And you think you mentioned World War II and President Roosevelt. You also, uh, in your book, uh, mentioned, say, the Berlin Wall as kind of a, 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 a tipping point. And you also use a reference of grassroots uh, involvement and uh, a political power. Mm -hmm. uh, smoking is the one, getting right. rid of smoking, right. so it can be done. So there are people who are watching us right now saying, what can I do? Right. The latter model I call the sandwich model of of social change, where you have 
pressure from the bottom and support from the top. Yep. That's what we have now in the U.S. On, on most environmental issues. Sometimes the support from the top is not as large. But the most important things we can do right now as individuals is to get involved. For example, the Sierra Club's goal now is to close every coal-fired power plant in the United States. So far, they're, they've closed 120 out of 492. They're moving, and, and it's going to keep going. Uh, coal has to go. Even Mayor Bloomberg gave Sierra $50 million to help with this campaign. When, when one of the most successful businessmen of this generation says coal has to go, you have to take it seriously. Mm. we got to go. This was a tremendous education for us and a great contribution to our series. Thank I've, you. I've enjoyed it thoroughly. Thank you very keep, much. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you, Lester. For information about my new book, The Chance of a Lifetime, an online video for all This Is America programs, visit our website, thisisamerica.net. And now you can follow us on Facebook. This Is America is made possible by the National Education Association, the nation's largest advocate for children and public education. Poonsan Corporation, forging a higher global standard. The CTC Foundation, AFO Communications, and the Rotondaro Family Trust.